Did you know that a plant from African continent called Iboga can treat substance use disorder? And the substances I'm talking about here are opiates. Not only that, it can treat PTSD and other types of mental illnesses. Well, if you know nothing about Iboga, in this episode you're going to learn a lot. This is an episode like no other. In fact, I will be talking not by myself. I have made an interview with a fellow human rights activist and drug reform and harm reduction policy activist. His name is David Subiliani. He's Georgian citizen, not the Georgia that is in the US, the Georgia that is the motherland of wine, pretty much. So, he possesses a degree in organizational psychology, as well as master's degree in International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University of Rotterdam. He's been working relentlessly to shape human lives for better by advocating for changing the drug policies towards harm reduction. Not only that, he was conducting ceremonies with Iboga for people who suffered with opiate use disorder. This is going to be a really interesting episode. It's going to be an honest conversation about the ups and downs, the advantages and the dangers of Iboga. If you like it, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe and let me know whether or not it is good in the first place, because I'm struggling here. I'm trying to figure out like whether or not I should continue doing it. And you're the ones that need to decide the faith of this podcast. Thank you very much and enjoy this episode. And until next time. Okay, let me start. So let me introduce myself and Vlad and welcome to a new episode of Entheogenic Renaissance. And today I'm talking with David and David is from Georgia and we're currently located in Vilnius uh, nearby at the event organized by Legalize Belarus and partners. So uh, I'll give it to David to introduce himself. A really nice place, isn't it? Here. Yeah. It is. I mean, people don't see, but around, around that building here we have a beautiful lake kind of chilly in the morning but the whole sun comes out and uh, real beautiful I mean when I was coming here I thought we would spend time in Vilnius it was cool also because I have some friends and I thought maybe I'll see them but from the airport I was taken here in the woods and around the lake and this quiet retreat center real, uh, real I mean real nice place and um, and real nice people from Belarus activists um, I know the organization legalized but from old times so from like a couple of years ago I never met so many of them, and uh, I was really excited to spend some time with them. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I, just for the listeners and those who are watching, uh, David has just delivered a lecture on uh, narcotics and drugs and commission on narcotics and drugs and how it's done in UN. I don't know if you want to say a couple of words yeah, in terms maybe. of maybe you know, like your experience no, because, because you mentioned you went Belarus, there because Legalized Belarus is doing uh, lots of advocacy work. They recognize they have to do advocacy on an international level as well, and. Uh, when it comes to drugs, um, the place to go is Vienna. <laughs> Not only, but because <laughs> uh, in Vienna a lot of things happen. That's also one particular aspect we talked about. CNE, Commission on Narcotic Drugs, what happens there? What kind of gathering is that? Uh, what is it you can achieve there? What kind of frustrations you can expect there? It's all that. So it was interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I had a... Mm, uh, uh, I have an experience of spending uh, time on a couple of CNDs. Um, so it was cool to share. Um, I have a follow-up question on that topic. So in this 2024 and CND 67 for the first time for the entire history of the committee, a new concept was introduced and got on paper, which is harm reduction. To the best of my knowledge, it was originally brought by United States because they are facing a big problem of uh, opioid crisis and 100,000 people are overdosing yearly. And they were the ones that originally, in my view at least, introduced the prohibition in the first place. But now they're kind of trying to reverse the tide and bring the harm reduction. So I wanted to ask your opinion uh, about what you think, whether or not it is a significant, substantial shift in terms of the general policy around um, controlling substances. It definitely is. It's not the ultimate goal. It's not that we achieve big things, but uh, without bringing in the harm reduction language in official 
documents and whatever, uh, the proceedings of these UN organizations and whatever. We can't really hope to have real harm reduction programs rolling out uh, and funded by governments for people who use drugs. So, yeah, lots of debate on harm reduction. Um, still, so much more money goes to prohibition rather than to harm reduction, which is obvious that the government should be reversing that and just putting money to reverse the harms from drugs and from regulating drugs, actually. Uh, but no, yeah, that's important because that the paradigm shift uh, that's taking place very slowly, that instead of prohibition, we'll focus on harm reduction. So yeah, of course, uh, it's important that um, this CND, as I was told, they had some good achievements in terms of harm reduction, promoting harm reduction, so mm. yeah. Beautiful, thanks. And um, harm reduction, to uh, it was debated heavily and uh, a lot of time spent around understanding like, what harm reduction means in fact. What are your thoughts? How would you describe what is harm reduction policy? I know whatever we do uh, can have a um, different effect on us, on our lives. Uh, and uh, sometimes some, some of the things we do can have a negative influence. And uh, uh, basically harm reduction means uh, putting measures in place to minimize those negative effects uh, from different things. Uh, if we talk about uh, taking drugs, um, there are lots of harms, mostly from the current regulation systems, because we know that most of the countries taking drugs and having drugs is prohibited. So people who choose to do that, they end up being uh, sidelined, they end up being um, stigmatized, criminalized, their lives are being taken, whatever, their health is not the priority ever. So uh, when we talk about harm reduction, we are talking about putting systems, programs, actions, in place that addressing those needs of people instead of uh, prohibiting them to take drugs something they choose you know mm. thank you very much yeah it's um, it's an important shift and one other thing that i wanted to highlight is the, the very big one it's an elephant in the room the stigma that you mentioned do you have any ideas on how to break stigma actually <laughs> No, I don't have. To, I don't have because um, totally <laughs> um, stigma is a. I don't know. It takes time. Takes time. Uh, take. You need to discuss. You need to open up. It takes. It takes uh, from. A th big part of the stigma is within the community somehow. The first of all, the community members themselves have to recognize the stigma that lives in them and uh, try to destigmatize themselves and open up and come out. Uh, without that, you can't really hope. But because of that, because of this, precisely all these kind of gatherings that we are attending right now is very important because all the people who come attend these meetings, they are more empowered to talk about it, to, to, to talk about that stigma, to try to move away from that. So. Yeah, it's a long process, and what I've seen sometimes you think that stigma is gone, but the stigma lives uh, deep in uh, uh, our norms and uh, somehow irrationally. Sometimes you know the rational answer to stigma, but stigma still affects you. Mm. Uh, that's how strong it is. Uh, and uh, bad policies that governments take uh, and implement for decades and decades and decades create such a stigma, so sick, it lives in our unconscious levels and affects us in such a way that we don't even recognize uh, not only us people who take drugs but people who don't take drugs uh, especially them and uh, therefore it's very important to uh, challenge people on that and if you want to challenge the societies whole societies the whole cultures uh, you need a strong voice and strong voice is hard to achieve without uh, governments being on board and stuff uh, so if governments are messing up with your messaging, uh, you can't really hope to uh, defeat the stigma. So, yeah, that's the process. And, um, yeah, I'm okay. kind of lost in answering. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries, no worries. We're improvising here yeah. anyway. So d you mentioned one interesting thing that I've already encountered with my within myself is the self-stigma so to speak so i've been consuming psychoactive substances for like 22 years so far and in the majority of life i had to kind of hide it from people and not being able to talk about it openly 
And uh, I must say that it's been a long journey for me to just recognize myself as a consumer of psychoactive substances. And it, it only last year I uh, recognized that I can, and I should talk about it in the open, because before that, coming from the police state, uh, being Russia, and pretty much living in Georgia, or was 1984, I was never able to talk about it in the open. And now that I live in Lithuania, of course, things are different. And uh, Isn't this, it interesting? It, that it took you so much time it to took me realize while. that uh, there's a big part of you is stigma basically stigma makes you not talk or talk it is i i do remember i was heavily in, into drug policy activism by then when i realized that i had a huge stigma on uh uh injecting drugs and the way uh, on injecting as such uh, as, as a way of uh, administering drugs and uh, I, I was on one of these conferences where people during a coffee break they just disappeared and uh they were drug user gathering and uh, so where are these people and they ended up in well, somebody's room in the hotel and uh, I knocked the door and everybody was just injecting theirs. <laughs> so what? what's going on? I was like, <laughs> and it was this moment that I thought that Jesus Christ, what are you doing? And uh, what is, but of course, these are the people who use drugs. <laughs> Why the hell they wouldn't use? I mean, I knew they wouldn't want to wait three, four days until the conference is over to go home and take drugs. and. It was that, that moment, that simple moment that I realized that I had a big, big stigma on injecting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say that helped me to start injecting afterwards, but, <laughs> 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 but yeah, uh, I ended up injecting at some point. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting experience because I, I've also been um, all, I kind of against the needles. I have this, I don't know, repulsion when I see a needle when I need to go to do the blood test. But uh, explain, like, how was it? It's I find it how, how stigma, coming back to how yeah, stigma yeah. works. And I would say, oh, I never inject. Of course, I don't inject drugs. Mm -hmm. But I take psychedelics. I, I, I smoke marijuana, take club drugs. Come on, give me a break. So how does it make you any better than any, I know? And then, you know, not really formally saying that I'm any better than others, but I was kind of in the back of my <laughs> brain. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not injecting drug user. <laughs> kind of, uh, I'm kind of new drug user that fits in uh, the modern lives, and it's not the janky thing. But then at some point you realize that it doesn't matter. It's just a contextual thing. And then it's just people who take some substances. If you broaden up that subject of taking drugs mm. from the narrow experience of taking a specific drug in a specific context and getting a hit and high, from there you just expand your consciousness or just look down on your earth where you come from, where you live, and just see how many people, animals and whatever, take different substances. They interact with substances. This is our universe. This is the chemicals that we live with. So we eat them, we swallow them, we you know, we do all the kind of things. It's very really normal. That's that's how it should it should be on any planet. <laughs> Could be if you would design any uh, new earth or something, it would bring chemicals and it would bring people. Of course, at some point they would start interacting with each other, and uh, and um, they don't do it for nothing. Mm. Clearly, they must have some benefits doing it, huh? And we know that. <laughs> you know, we can talk uh, loads about the benefits of taking drugs and uh, stuff. But yeah, again, I got lost in my. But uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting talking about stigma. How easily you can get stigmatized and think that you are not stigmatized and think that oh, you're fully mm, emancipated from that old feelings and uh, you're just well, no. Yeah, I mean the aspect that can stay as a stigma and um, yeah, stigma is something to fight against and uh, it's a big thing uh, even if uh, laws change um, stigma will stay and uh, uh, what we would expect from normal governments not only just to change laws but to put all efforts everything needed to change the stigma that's what they should be busy with rather than prohibiting and funding police uh, uh, units uh, to chase us and whatever but uh, yeah well, just a quick one. Uh, what's the most effective like tool against stigma that, you, from your experience, there you would highlight? Um, in my case, it was just my personal experiences and uh, my internal dialogue, reflection. reflection and dialogue with myself. And uh, kind of, we all have. I mean, we all know when we stay honest with ourselves and when we are kind of. Covering some some aspects of our lives, and uh, in that moment, which which I, which I 
just told you when I when I saw people injecting and they realized mm -hmm. they had the stigma. I, I couldn't lie that on I mean, I should have stayed honest with myself. I had an option to, s to forget about the realization of mm. stigma and continue as it was. That would have been easier, but I can really be honest. I mean, I needed to be honest because me as an activist working with other drug users, how come I cannot be honest with my, with my own self? And it was like, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, I have a stigma. So that's, I, cut, I could recognize. And yeah, experiences are important. Saying you should remove stigma doesn't help you. You have to go through a certain experience. Mm. Or, or it has to be, it has to take a lot of time until you really realize that this is not that way. Yeah. yeah. I hear you. Thanks. Um, one other thing that I wanted to ask about um, the medicine. Well, nowadays it's being called plant medicine and we'll talk about it and switch gears here. But before going there, I just wanted to highlight that basically uh, there is a rich history of interactions between humankind and drugs. And once we say drugs, we need to recognize that alcohol is a drug, nicotine is a drug, caffeine is a drug, and those drugs have been used uh, by people through millennia. And if we're talking about psychoactive substances, we need to mention that mescaline was used by indigenous people in South Af uh, America sorry, for thousands of years. Ayahuasca ceremonies, Ibogaine from uh, African continent, which we're going to talk about real soon. Cannabis, part of uh, other cultures as well, like oh, yeah. in India, River Gun or ganja and the saying that on the seventh day Shiva created hashish it never disappeared it just got prohibited over the last like 67 years or so but it doesn't mean that it was never there it was part of human development and human history so yeah let's finally talk about Ib ibogaine Ibaga, it's the substance yeah. that I've never interacted with I've heard a lot I've heard that it treats uh, PTSD and it's currently used in uh, USA to treat veterans uh, success Fully. There's promise in showing that and I've also heard that it's being used in Ukraine to also treat people with PTSD. However, of all the psychedelic substances, or how I prefer to call them entheogenic substances, we need to make a rebranding here because psychedelic is a tricking, uh, triggering is, word. Is, is. But entheogens is more of a different one and people tend to think like, well, what is entheogen? <laughs> Rather, oh, psychedelic is a drug. So yeah, just uh, quickly going back to you again, uh, tell me whatever you know, let's start here. Yeah. Um, Ibogaine is an mm, alkaloid, specific alkaloid that is part of a plant called Iboga. Iboga comes from Gabon, West Africa, and it's been used there for like thousands of years maybe. Pygmy people, uh, the local tribes who live there, they've been using them. I never went to Gabon, but my friends were there. Um, and uh, they told me crazy stories about how what what, what it means for uh, Gabonese people that plant Iboga. It's really taken as a miracle drug, and uh, it is a miracle drug, <laughs> miracle medicine basically. They have lots of um, plant-based medicines, lots of them. Mm -hmm. The crazy ones, uh, I you know I know the stories, but they consider Iboga as you know standing on the top of that. Mm. So it's real like king of the king of the medicines there, and. Um, um, it's a big part of their culture. They they take it different ways. Um, many Gabonese take it on a daily basis, a uh, very small amount. Oh, wow. A very small amount. It just stimulates a little bit. Uh, doesn't give you any hallucinogenic effect or whatever, but you know, it just... It's like microdosing? Yeah, kind of microdosing. Oh. I don't know if there's a scientific backing on that, but that's the tradition, huh? that's how people... But also... It's sorry, quick one. Do they do it throughout their life on a daily basis? Uh, and no details, but yeah, I mean, many people just take it, you know, like, you know, like you smoke weed or something, yeah. you know, whatever. I know. Um, but also, they use it as a medicine uh, for particular problems. If they have an infection or something, it's very good for infections. Uh, different amounts for different things. But the most important one, uh, the application of burger is um, in ceremonies they use um, in spiritual practices mm -hmm. uh, to initiate people and to you know restart people. <laughs> kind of, if you can say that restart um, like it's a big event for people who go through these ceremonies they want to change something they want catharsis they want reshaping their uh, they want to clean up they want to restart or whatever um, so they go through the ceremony they take Iboga Iboga is a plant it crosses a bush and then the, the useful part is in this uh, uh, roots root root part root, mm. yeah uh, so yeah, they swallow, they chew it. Uh, it's very bitter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've tried it. <laughs> and um, so the ceremony goes for long, and uh, 
people get different impacts from it and uh, they usually report feeling of her you know yeah. reborn or something and being able to say no to some bad habits and uh, uh, and being able to come terms with new life or something if if say if someone was on a bad track and wants to change something they might do that and they might go and do through the ceremony to restart themselves whatever um, uh, but in 90s um, um, it became clear to someone who was using heroin, the American citizen, um, uh, his name, I forgot. Um, um, he, he took it by chance. Um, uh, his friend recommended. In 90s? Uh, more 80s, maybe. Uh, yeah, kind of. And, um, and he was a heavy addict. And, uh, uh, where was it, sorry? I think he was in Gabon. Ah. Uh, and uh, he took it and... Um, uh, he doesn't remember much, <laughs> but when he came out of the thing, he just realized that he was feeling so much different than uh, any other time, and uh, was full of energy and uh, arch for life, and um, things looked okay, <laughs> like bright and nice, and uh, he realized he didn't want his dose of heroin anymore. <sighs> like no I don't want that so, you know, like something you do all the time and uh, oh but he never intended to stop heroin you know? he didn't know the Iboga would have the kind of effect on it. yeah he just took mm -hmm. it as a drug to try what it is mm -hmm. and um, and uh, he didn't go to ceremony he just took it in his room <laughs> yeah wow. yeah and um, that's a risky way to do it yeah so he was okay he said okay and he found it interesting and he invited his five friends also heroin users and uh, repeated the exercise and okay. uh, they also kind of said oh we don't want heroin anymore wow. so it looked like something uh, big they've hit and um, that's how it started uh, uh, Howard lots of I think his name was okay. and um, and uh, oh, lots of yeah lots of and uh, so that's how it started and then it became clear to different people and organizations then the slow movement started and this guy tried a lot in back in us to promote mm. uh he started to put in place the protocols and he found he found it some he found some uh, uh researchers to research this and that he did all that and uh there were some trials also uh but iboga has a problem iboga interacts with the cardiovascular system also mm -hmm. and um it lowers the to explain it very yeah, simple language it's, it's it lowers the heartbeat mm -hmm. um slows it down slows it down mm -hmm. kind of the beginning and uh that could be a problem if you have in a system opioids mm -hmm. or benzodiazepines or something like that oh, antidepressants or um depending on antidepressants yeah, but yeah. not not all of it uh, and benzos and uh opiates are really problematic with iboga and also you take iboga Opiates also work the same direction on the heart, and uh, and iboga and uh, opiate together, they mm. could have a critical impact. Uh, you might have cardiac arrest. So there have been cases of people losing their lives. Uh, so I guess it's just important to highlight to those it is. who ever decide to yeah, it don't is. combine. It is. It can. It can. It can uh, be very problematic. And uh, so uh, because of that, DA in US uh, rejected the trials um, so there were a couple of researches here and there some uh, so we know some evidences but the big researches have not uh, have have been discontinued at some point so Iboga never took off basically mm. l legally as a way to uh, uh, affect uh, addiction issue but of course informally and in many many other countries where it could have been done People started to practice it like everything else, and like mm -hmm. uh, uh, nowadays, we have in more than 150 clinics uh, in the world uh, wow. who practice iboga, who all give all iboga. Over the world. Well, all over the, the world. Which countries? Uh, just oh, like uh, for instance, the closest I might think of is Portugal. Okay, because uh, it's decriminalized there. Or uh, the drugs are decriminalized in Portugal, and I'm not sure iboga is scheduled there, anyways. Uh, but yeah. You can do that in Portugal. You have uh, here and there some, some centers in Europe, but a lot of centers in Mexico, Costa Rica, places like that, Canada, hmm. New Zealand, Australia. Uh, so I've met many people from different parts of the world who do that. Some do 
in a kind of private kind of sessions, visiting uh, the clients at home and doing the iboga, or some doing the clinic settings. Uh, they've got some medical equipment, they have medical personnel mm. in place, they monitor the heartbeat and this and that. And that. So there are different methodologies. But um, yeah, they have a good, uh, good results. I mean, I've met lots of lots of people who've gone through Iboga and uh, they've managed uh, to achieve what they wanted to achieve uh, or big improvements. I myself have uh, tried it once oh. and I can tell the experience. Please, <laughs> please sure. It was November 21, I think. I've been, uh, back then, I've been a long, long time drug user. Uh, and before I didn't have much of problems with that, but um, somehow the last few years it was very heavy for me and um, had some breakdowns, I had some my personal issues, work, this, that, mm. and also kind of started to kind of uh, use different drugs in a way that wasn't really useful anymore for me. It wasn't really helping my problem and my long depression and stuff. It was like a big long depression I had a couple of two, two years long or something. And I was just using more drugs, but not helping. And uh, I was an activist also. And I remember there's a famous activist in the US, Dana Beal. He used to be a weed activist a long time ago, and he was the one who brought the huge joint in front of the White House <laughs> <laughs> decades ago, and he was in prison a couple of times. And he's nearly 80 years old right now, and mm. he was just imprisoned a couple of months ago again ah, yeah, for moving, seen, for yeah, moving uh, weed from one state to another state. And um, he's, he's the one who is bringing Boga to Ukraine right he, now, right? Uh, he's the one who was working, and I mean, I, 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 I will tell about yeah, that, but uh, he's, your yeah, he's the one who introduced the Boga to me. Oh. He found me as a drug policy activist in Georgia, and he, I just remember, uh, he just wrote me out of a sudden, hey, David, uh, I've learned about you. It seems you've got a lot of drug users there in Georgia. You might need the Iboga there. So I was like, who is this guy? Who, what is Iboga? Where did he write it? <laughs> he just put a, he's a lovely guy, an old lovely guy. He doesn't really know much how to use the social media and stuff. He put just on my wall, <laughs> Facebook wall. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the time it was open, it was, anybody could post anything, it was like, what is Iboga? I mean, <laughs> I was like, I was ignoring it for like a long time, but um, when the problem hit me, I remembered about it and started talking about it, started to explore it, and I decided I would go for Iboga, and uh, we brought a lot of people. Dana helped me to fun finance the conference in Georgia. We did a conference oh. in uh, Tbilisi, Ilya Uni. Uh, about Ibo about Iboga and how Iboga can help. We brought all the uh, medical doctors working in drug fields. And, and it's uh, prohibited in Georgia, right? It's not. It's not, it's not in oh. list states. They don't. <laughs> it's not in the list. So, and um, we brought we brought all these uh, people from different countries, practitioners, researchers. We brought the Georgians. We brought the community uh researchers so i was a three-day meeting just to familiarize people with the boga this and that but then then there was this um pandemic so mm. i wasn't really doing much in terms of developing that further it wasn't really possible and at some point somebody just came to help me take iboga instead of starting iboga work in georgia it was decided that i would take it i decided okay, at least me <laughs> so i remember a dear friend Corey from Canada, as an old practitioner, came to me, stayed in Tbilisi for a month in my little apartment. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, I remember um, stopping using uh, su Supertex, Subuxin. I was taking Subuxin, I think, mm. back then. Uh, Buprenor, is Buprenor is the, okay. yeah. From pain? No, no, I was, it's, it's a, it's a um, opiate drug. Ah, okay. So I was taking, and it's a long acting, uh, it stays in your system for like a long time. Mm. Um, like herring just goes very quickly, a couple mm -hmm. of days, and that one stays for weeks. Oh, wow. So it was harder because I had to stop using it for a couple of weeks before the Iboga to make sure that I don't have any opiate in my system. So I remember 10 days not taking anything mm, I guess it was for the hard. first time, but I, was, I had an intention, I had a motivation, so I was okay. And I took Iboga, and I think I was um, the one uh, on... Uh, forgettable experience altogether okay. but I had taken a lot of um, mind-altering substances before a lot of psychedelics and I love psychedelics and uh, I love LSD and I love mushrooms and taking lots of designer uh, psychedelics and you name it just moxie <laughs> <Sugar and sugars. laughs> yeah <laughs> 
well, whatever, but I had not, uh, but nothing could compare with what Iboga did to me. And um, um, it's just eight hours, nonstop, full swing trip. I don't even call it hallucination. Technically, it's not hallucination. It's a daydreamer. You're awake, but you dream. Something that happens when you sleep and dream, imagine if that was going on when you are awake. Hmm. It's just constant, nonstop, parallel consciousness that is going on. Right now, I look at you, but if I had the boga, I would also see kind of screen in between oh, wow. you and me and things going on there. So the recommendation for iboga takers is not to really open eyes, just to close it and go inside introspection, wow. go inside okay. yourself. So that was the way I took. I was laid down because it, it, what it does also, it immo kind of immobilizes you, not, not fully, but you can't really walk hmm. well. You might fall here and there. You need support. So I was on so my... So cedar is required. Yeah, cedar is required to comfort you, to give you water if you need hmm. to. You might throw sometimes, vomit, purge, hmm. uh, bring out the bad things. <laughs> and uh, so you, might, you just need someone else, but mostly you're on your own eyes closed and tripping um yeah, usually a lot of people you know encounter their traumas uh like all that kind of process it goes through your traumas and we know how traumas how how affect how uh strong the, aff the impact of traumas is on us on our ways of you know how the, the addiction is kind of built on traumas i think and uh and uh, instead of going a slow psychotherapy that would take years and years to you know, wipe out all these traumas that are holding your addictions and your behavior after all, you see that over, you know, single administration of that substance and eight hours of tripping and a couple of days of non-sleep, that was it, and then you're back. That was just enough that I wouldn't really feel any impact from all my traumas. And my two-year-long heavy depression was gone like that wow. and even my face was different wow. and when i looked first time because it was a heavy process in me because i might be believe that the harder the problems are in your <laughs> psyche the harder the experience will be of viboga itself and uh, i took a heavy heavy dose uh, it's basically according to your weight mm. um it was a good trip a strong one and um I came out, I came out, I had like four days of non-sleep, insomnia, it was the hardest. And at some point I lost my, and, you know, belief that Iboga is helping. And I, oh. I was thinking the other way. I was like, no, it's, it didn't work for me. Hmm. I'm feeling so bad. Because when you are in insomnia after taking Iboga, that's the process when, when, the, when your mind is kind of um, doing final changes i guess and yeah and i think yeah. the sleep is very important yes and i i physically I couldn't sleep nothing is helping to sleep you like after you broke a couple of days you're guaranteed non-sleep oh. and it's hard and the time goes very slow i remember just looking on my watch and there's people next door sleeping there and they have to sleep they will sleep next three hours until morning and i can't sleep a second there and oh geez uh, oh. so it was it and um uh, but yeah, finally I was back and uh, I didn't want even cigarettes, <laughs> which I didn't think I would talk about. But I came out and I hated cigarettes. For the first puff, I, uh, I said, no, I can't smoke this. I hate it. Coffee. I couldn't take coffee. Oh, man, and I was, coffee. I was coffee. Oh. And uh, not, I'm not even talking about the opiates. And there were a lot of opiates around me, yeah. but I didn't have any interest at whatsoever. And uh, for the first time, I felt so empowered, so empowered that uh, I was like, oh, it's unbelievable because I know that there is nothing on the world, on this world, there is nothing that can do that kind of miracle so quickly, so efficiently. And um, Iboga did that. Um, but um, I think that's not the most, I mean, the, the one aspect is what the medicine can do to you in a short run. But you have to do a lot of work afterwards. That's mm. really important. Like in every transformative process, you have to integrate new yourself with the new reality you have. So I had my best version in my thinking available. Uh, the one who was strong, brighter, smiley, non-depressed, not wanting to take this and that to hide from problems and from reality. Somebody who was able to 
challenge things, somebody who was able to, you know, whatever. And, but I had my old habits, I had my old friends, I had my old systems where I was doing differently. So I had to change that and I had to have something else instead. So if you're changing a big part of your life, you need to know how you will compensate for the kind of loss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people who have taken Iboga but have not really done much to change their actual lives after, right. af afterwards, they came back to drug using behavior again a couple of months later. But people who try to integrate this new, new themselves they got because of Iboga, uh, with the reality, find a new job or, you know, find new friends or whatever. Whatever is for you, you know, changing this, starting to exercise. Uh, all these people are very happy now. And uh, so what I really know is the bugger is, the bugger works for sure. It can have a problem uh, if, if it's not taken uh, well, uh, if you don't pay attention to risks that I talked about, this and that. But... It, it does it does it, it gives you a powerful like push to towards what you want and uh, that's why they call it miracle medicine because it really is a miracle medicine i mean i don't know if not iboga how else i would be able to uh be here where i am right now uh or it would take me much longer time maybe mm. so yeah Got a lot of questions, but I don't know where to start. But let's um, just a quick one. What what helped you integrate the experience? Uh, intention. Intention is always good. Uh, there are people who came uh, to take Iboga, but they didn't really have any intention or mm. big motivation themselves. It was more external just for them. No, there were people who have family pressure or friends pressure. I think uh, him or her. Oh, you need to take, and you know how drug users sometimes. Oh, yeah, uh, but I can't. I can't. I can't really. Rem you know, I can't really deal with it. But they, in their heart, they don't, maybe don't want to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they say, okay, I'll try this and that to family members because they can't really resist the pressure. They come, but in their heart, they don't really want to change. So in that case, it's a lost uh, practice. It's interesting practice maybe, but it's it's not going to give you, you know, it's not going to get you there because you don't want to. Yeah. So it basically gives you what you want. Right. Yeah. So uh, then I started to help others also to access this beauty, uh, medicine, medicine and knowledge and whatever. Um, so I saw people who had uh, genuine interest and motivation to change and they are so happy right now. They keep sending me messages and their family members keep sending me messages over wow. three years now how happy they are and how happy they are. There was a guy and this and that because that changed the course of their lives and their families. Uh, uh, but um, I know people who didn't have intention, so they came back to their old uh, way pretty soon. Because Iboga gave them short time something for a couple of months, but then unless you change things, what you're doing when you have a problem, you go to back to your knowledge. And if you know that drugs were there to help you in this situation, that situation, yeah, you're going to go back to drugs. So that's the key thing. Um, uh, so, in good intention, good way of administering it without risks, and then try to integrate. Uh, but this is it, like with every other practice. Like, um, there are no miracles, actually. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have to do some work. It's not that you touch something and you become different. Yeah. I thought so in the beginning that it was Iboga. Iboga is a real miracle, in a way, but uh, it's not the 100% job. Nice but you, you have to you have to add your, uh, your own efforts as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, um, so yeah, Iboga stays um, one of the big interests for me. Um, um, I'm not doing Iboga at the moment, um, uh, but I think it is the. It has a future, and I think it will take a big part in future ways how different societies will treat um, addiction and uh, PTSD and uh, all sorts of mental issues. I have to say that Iboga is good not only for drug addiction. I have to say, it's many people who have no interaction with drugs, no experience of taking drugs, take Iboga just for um, psychological problems. Mm. Like I had two people around me, friends, um, who took Iboga. Uh, they had some personal issues, one, some social. I have a friend of mine who, who he, he had an issue of, uh, he wasn't able to look at people in eyes. He would be overwhelmed. Mm. So he had a, issue of staying in contact 
his life life context of a lot of people around so did it help yeah it did huh. it he says that if he's given a chance to select one final substance for the world it would be vodka. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like get rid of coffee? Yeah, like, oh. I mean he said that. that, that <laughs> okay. And um, the other one also was struggling to solve his um, family issues, mm. and now uh, he also did that. And now um, he and his former wife are both <laughs> very thankful for. <laughs> <laughs> That's great <really> work. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, another thing that I wanted to ask you is that you mentioned that you had previous experience with psychedelics and LSD and mushrooms. How would you compare experience of Iboga with those at least? And they, they say that, you know, there's a life-changing experience once you take psilocybin or LSD for that matter. But then again, it sounds as if it's very different. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's, um, I haven't, I mean, if I use psilocybin the way I used uh Iboga, maybe size. I mean, I mean, I don't know. Because I still, I mean, I started to took psilocybin and LSD much earlier, in different ways, not for healing, but for fun mostly. And uh, it was just later on that I realized that it has kind of healing power too. But yeah, I mean, as such, it's very you know fun to observe how it affects your mentality, your perception. In the beginning, it's really nice. You know, things look different, and it's kind of weird, but also nice. You know, mm -hmm. oh, cool. It's your mentality, it's your consciousness. Oh, that's so different from the old ways mm -hmm. so it as such is very interesting of course uh, but uh, it hasn't yeah we know as we know now psychedelics have a powerful effect on uh, therapeutic processes and uh, but Iboga I don't know I, Iboga I haven't really taken for fun I can't really take yeah. it for fun it, it's, it's not a, it's not a dark uh, party drug or something and you're immobilized you're you can't really walk freely mm. and uh, uh, you don't feel good on your stomach and everything, you just you vomit every half an hour, so and it's like uh, in a sense. yeah, uh, I mean it's it's uh, it's a guided heavy process, very intense process, very intense trip, very intense, very intense. Mm. It's like vivid, like a video screen or something, and uh, I don't know. I mean, you have you have to have your own agenda with everything. I, one of the things I was thinking about before my trip it was my issue with my father, mm. not being able to. Uh, physically be close to him and uh, show my emotions kind of kind of some blocks i have but in my mind i have a lot of warmth towards him but i can't really hug him or something so i had i was thinking on that kind of issue too and during that trip uh, at some point i ended up in a uh, nature in a trip okay. and there was a big tree and uh, under the big tree there was my father sitting uh -huh. and i was like very a well, small child like four or five years old myself hmm. i knew i was small one and it was my father and i was running towards him to sit in his uh lap, lap. and it was like something i <laughs> in my age now i'm 48 <laughs> i mean i had an issue of closeness and stuff and much so i had a kind of trip and i was happy to be in his arms and sitting on his lap and he was hugging me and he was kissing me and uh, it was kind of that trip gave me the experience and uh and then I was in that trip. I was like, I have to go, Father. And he was like, no, stay with me. And I was like, no, I have to go. I have some other things to do, I was saying. Mm. But I'll come back. I'll find, you, I'll find you again. And then I was again the big boy, big one adult mm. in my trip. And I remember during all trip, I remembered I had to find my father again. Mm. I had different things to do, but I uh, couldn't find my father. The whole trip, I was looking for him. And then I came out, I had this one thing I was thinking, I just, everything was okay, but I, it wasn't enough with my father because it was this big moment with him, mm. but I had to come back and uh, it didn't happen again. So, But then I realized that uh, it just, Boga just gave me a very simple way. The next day I went to my father. Oh, nice. <laughs> I hugged him and nice. I told him the story and he was all in tears. And, wow. uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I know. Yeah, that's a great story, man. <laughs> um, I'm eager to understand more about the kind of therapeutic context. So it seems that the substance requires like proper setting and well, the set, of course. Uh, but then again, uh, currently the psychedelic assisted therapy is considered as a way of treating mental illnesses with the help of a therapist, even though the therapist is acting a part of a container and not interfering. Nevertheless, uh, in the approach with the boga, is it the same? Is this just a sitter, just a container, or is it somebody that helps you kind of navigate during the, your journey and help you? Uh, there's not much you can do in terms of navigation other than comforting people. Uh, like, you know, if you want to pee, I, I'm going to help you to take it to 
uh, you walk you to the bathroom, this and that, and whatever. If, if, if bad feelings come to you, just might give you some advice. Don't try to close your eyes oh. uh, or something like that. Or if too, something too, too much, Hmm. In your too, brand, intense. too intense and you don't want it anymore just open your eyes and it will oh. stop like a dream because okay. it's a dream remember it's not hallucination it's a dream so every time you are in a sleep and somebody comes in and you wake up dream stops mm. huh <laughs> mm. make a bag but <laughs> usually don't so that is the I'm um, so for a couple of people who had uh, very intense experience and didn't really have much experience with psychedelics before and whatever so it was too much for them I would just go and sometimes they would just open your eyes, a couple of words, you're good, okay, bye. <laughs> that's <laughs> it, sleep. that's it, you know, for sure, that in a second you do that, uh, the bad one is stopped, oh, and then wow. the, the, the new, new cartoon will start. So. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, it's like simple things, um, try not to eat uh, like um, a day before, maybe mm. a banana or two, but yeah. You don't want, you want to vomit too much, so have your system empty, as empty as possible, so that uh, you don't get the disturbance. So, for instance, I didn't go to the toilet any single time, but some other people mm. who, don't, who can't really say no to food before, okay. <laughs> they have to ta be taken to the toilet. Just little things. And it's just part of the game, right? It part of the game. But then yeah. again, you know, the specifics, like um, I had somebody who was on benzos a lot. Mm. Um, uh, in combination with uh, lots of methamphetamine, I think. Mm. And uh, he had no single uh, experience of psychedelics or something, and it was a big, heavy guy. Uh, and he had this kind of, um, I don't know what we call it in English. In he, uh, can I, or in Russian, but he was like convulsion. Like, okay. like uh, he couldn't, he, he has spasms in hand, like that. Mm. So. So I needed to massage his hands and uh, say, it's okay. And he was like, um, am I okay? Am I going to be okay? He was kind of terrorized a little bit. Mm. Uh, but yeah, he was there. He just said, oh, no, people take it. I've taken it, no problem there. So usually it's manageable. It's not, I mean, only a couple of times it was that people were like overwhelmed with the experience. Oh, it's too much, but it just come down, breathe, I know, open your eyes. Mm. Uh, this, that. Usually it's very intense for a few hours for Around 30 minutes, text on set starts with ears buzzing. Ears buzzing. <laughs> Some people think there's a, is there a fly in the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's in the ear. It's for everybody. Yeah, yeah it's oh. it's for everybody. Okay. It just uh, you start to be very sensitive in your eyes, mm. in your ears, you know, s and organs of sensation. Mm -hmm. They sort of become restarted or something. You can hear people whispering the two rooms away. Wow. And when I was in my home, I was like, please stop, <laughs> stop, don't talk. Because <laughs> that comes, you just, yeah. you hear anything. So I usually you want your curtains off. Like you don't want, man, pretty much. Yeah, you don't want much of a uh, irritation. So yeah, that kind of stuff. And um, it starts with that. And after, after my first effect, I sensed in my ear, it took a, around 10 minutes. But I said, I have to go to my bed now because it's in, in your body starts feeling kind of awkward, different mm. way. So, you know, as an experienced drug user that uh, it's coming. <laughs> so you better be there. <laughs> it, you never know when you take it first time. And I was kind of afraid. I was kind of afraid. Um, yes, media does that. Even when media tells you that it can kill you. It mm. can really kill you. It is a not an easy factor. Uh, so uh, I know. How big is the chance though? Well, I mean, um, if you do properly, there's not a big chance. Like no um, heroin. Yeah, you, you, sh you should make oh, sure. You oh, should yes. make sure that your heart is okay, yeah, okay, your liver is okay. You don't have uh, huh. schizophrenia. You don't have. There are co some medical sure. conditions we know that research has already provided that if it's there, not take it, because they could lead you to complications. So, yeah. this is one thing: a pre pre medical checks and that. Uh, um, it sounds like it's required. It is, it is. I mean, I would, yeah. Uh, that is why, I mean, clinical settings is very good also because mm. uh, in clinical settings you can have, but some for some people who take drugs, they don't like clinical settings. Yeah, they, don't like pe sterile. they don't like people in uh, white coats. White coats stuff. So it's kind of uh, huh. borderline there. I mean, I don't know. So there are different ways how to do that. And um, hmm. yeah.
yeah um about the clinical setting and um, consumption of iboga so of course because of the rituals that are coming from the african continent i believe that it was taken in nature or some i don't yeah, know really in woods yeah so uh like and you say that it's done in the clinical setting so people are just for 48 hours in the clinical walls yeah they, they yeah they've been monitored and this and that and uh they they feel good anyway if you, if you decide to go to medical setting uh, i guess you feel better than with with them because you know that they are there I'm to help sure you but if you from the onset you don't want them you don't want them so yeah it's mm. but does that affect the trip i mean I, no. i can hardly imagine myself taking an lsd in a clinical setting it's just uh, too much for no, me i mean yeah i know what you're saying but i mean for instance um if you talk about um, psilocybin mushroom um it's also taken as part of the therapy and very effective I prefer in, to do it in nature. yeah but you don't get the same therapeutic effects then so it's it's for fun oh, it's little little yeah there's a research that that suggests that um uh, most you can get from psilocybin is as when it is done as part of the therapeutic process when you're in, in introspection your eyes closed mm. under special music yep. um and yeah But when we take psilocybin, we're chatting here and there, sitting there, laying down, I was saying, oh, see, what is, what is it I'm seeing here? Oh, fuck, this is interesting. <laughs> this is all fun, but you lose kind of focus on the main things. The um, internal uh, Internal so questions and processes. Mm. That's the thing, but yeah. But if you do it in, like, if you lay in nature yeah, with yeah, your yeah, eye yeah. shades and music and everything. Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. But I guess cedar is required anyway. It's and for e See, there is good because you know things can go wrong, and it, mm. you know not not necessarily too wrong, but you might need just water, and mm. not being able to organize yourself, and uh, <laughs> why to suffer with that need, and uh, you know if you have someone else to take care of you. I mean, that's yeah, they're crazy people who've taken it alone. <laughs> they're very brave and crazy people. Uh, that uh, sounds like it requires a lot of preparation indeed and shouldn't be yeah. taken even if you take a very very tiny dose i remember when i was huh. taking when i took it uh the it's next like a root like literally a root root, root bark it's a root bark and, and you just chew it and now you chew um, um, be, yeah and the traditional ways to uh, but what what they do now, right now is that you, you they process it and uh, they process it now we ha you have three different ways how it can take iboga for basically it's a root bark the most old way traditional way then you have um ibogaine okay It's taken out of iboga mm -hmm. semi synthetically oh. uh the actual substance Extracted. of a, one alkaloid the most important alkaloid al ibogaine and it's given you to you i haven't taken that i took like in a pill or something well, yeah whatever powder or something uh i took pta partial total alkaloid so what is it this you don't use any synthetic approach to these root bergs you just uh, put them in a vinegar whatever you just mm. uh, squeeze it squeeze it whatever the juice comes out of it you dry it whatever the remains there you just collect it and uh, that contains most of the alkaloids mm. that the plant has and some of the plant matter okay. and it's kind of believed that it's kind of best and better because ibogaine in isolation you know, is believed to have little harsher experience okay. while iboga with i beginning the other elements uh, it's kind of more uh kind of smooth and uh, mm. whatever there is yeah partial total alkaloid there is a total alkaloid just for all alkaloids partial total alkaloids and ibogaine and the root bark and four different ways the clinics usually like to take ibogaine because they can control they yeah. can make sure that it's really only that mm. one the quantity and quantity pureness. while while uh, if you take pta and pa you're not really sure sure mm. from what kind of plants was it taken right. and uh, how, what are the proportions they said yeah but it's like shitty alcohol <laughs> uh, uh, yeah i mean you don't know why, who who did it there are lots of issues come it it, it 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 is so i mean lots of westerners go to gabon collect the burger take home and this and that and um So there was wow. uh, the question of unethical sourcing. harvesting and yeah, sourcing yeah. and whatever yeah. came up. So there's there are some uh, organizations who kind of try to organize things there, so that Japanese people also take benefits mm -hmm. from what they have to offer us. And uh, so it's kind of more organized right now. Um, that, there's a lot of scam on the on the internet. You can mm -hmm. buy a lot of, you can find a lot of it bug up, but a lot of it will be crap. 
<laughs> yeah, way. or will be whatever, less effective, whatever. Or will be not, will not be uh, f enough toes or whatever. Oh. So and because it's not good, it's really hard to yeah. find a good debug on your own. Huh. So it's better to f to cooperate with your bug providers, right. the good ones. And Are there uh, any like licensed or how uh, does it work? You just uh, need to find the guy. No, I mean, in, uh, for instance, I mean, it, it depending on the country. I mean, in Georgia, there was nobody. It was just me who mm. took Iboga and who had access to Iboga and. Okay. Uh, so it was that way, very individual. But in, uh, if you go to Portugal, you can find an organization who does that, and they have a website. And, oh. uh, so yeah, you can look up for it. In Ukraine, in post-Soviet countries, like uh, there was this nice guy who had this um, uh, drug clinic, mm. and he incorporated Iboga. Mm. Uh, thanks to certain legal provisions, it was not really disallowed to try right. something like that. Okay. So he was using Iboga. It was not a nice guy. Yes. But he was in a very medical context. Mm. Prior to Iboga, he was just doing traditional drug treatments, mm. but he just learned there is a boga and uh, he introduced it and he's, he remained with a medical approach and whatever and all the nurses running around. I've seen <laughs> the pictures and stuff, but he was using a boga and it was nice. But then when the war uh, came mm. up and uh, uh, it was closed and he went to Prague, but I don't know. The last time before Dana was arrested now a couple of months ago, he was talking again, something you mentioned, yeah, yeah. Uh, somehow organizing. I was also supporting that because in Ukraine after war uh, or within that war context, they might need uh, initiatives like that to help lots of people to deal with the post-traumatic stress and uh, there's a lot of trauma that's yeah sure. so so in ukraine they had the experience but it's gone and i don't know how, how how close they are to bring it back in georgia i was doing it a bit and um had a bad accident um someone lost his life because oh, wow. because of, um yeah uh, the certain rules were not really followed well so it was a big impact. It had a huge impact on my practice and my yeah, life. Um, never imagined. I mean, I knew theoretically. Why, why did it happen? A person got, uh, didn't say that, you know, something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I had no other means just to ask them and remind that it's very risky. Sure. Uh, on the day he had to administer, I just asked again. Do you remember that? And he assured me that he didn't have he hasn't taken anything, but it turned out that he has taken again a good portion of heroin the day before. Uh, so uh, he was tripping, and on a third hour, wow. uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, Sorry to hear, man. Yeah. So it was two years ago, and um, that was the last time I had to deal with Iboga. Um, it was the last client I worked with. Mm. Um, for quite some time I was fighting in my mind to find the ways to come back with the burger because I know it is working and I know and it it's is not your fault yeah but it was even though I know it's not my fault it still is a heavy burden because you're part of that yeah. and um, well I mean one could say that my fault was to do Iboga practice altogether without a clinic, for instance. But, but uh, in this political and regulating system that we live in, there would be no Iboga clinic ever. Yeah. But me taking that experience personally, me risking my own life mm -hmm. and going through Iboga and finding the thing I was looking for, of course, I wouldn't shut, shut up. I would tell that story to many people. And I told my story to many people, especially I was drug policy activist and I had to deal with lots of people who use drugs so and lots of people who were looking for a solution for their own problems so I had to share and I shared my story publicly um, on TV on wow, digital media this and that and hundreds, of hundreds of people hundreds of people started to write to me and uh, asking to help even even now they keep writing me wow. I got like my e inbox is full of that kind of stuff and uh, so I was like, maybe I have to share what I know. And um, so I took a very slow approach and I was like, you know, it's, it's lots of risks involved. Sure. Maybe you go to Portugal, but it's expensive. It costs like 7,000 euro there. <laughs> you mean to conduct a ceremony in Portugal? To go to a clinic and uh, stay there uh, for some time, uh, take preparations, take Iboga, stay afterwards for uh, mm. after Iboga support this and that it costs seven thousand euros so not, you have to travel you have to so not many people can do that and uh so are there any countries maybe with, that could be cheaper 
It, maybe, to, but it's far away, Mexico. So if Thailand. You, Thailand is that, but I mean, if you go far away, so uh, maybe a little cheaper, but nowhere cheaper. There are clinics who sell Iboga treatments for 10, 15, 20,000. You know, the uh, most famous case uh, who took Iboga for, call for addiction problem is uh, Biden's son. It's a big one. <laughs> he took Iboga. <laughs> yeah. There, there are some big, big names. I mean, if you look up, I mean, there's a the, sure. the big, big piece on, uh, what well, was it? Which magazine was it? It was Times or something. Um, mm -hmm. One of those published a big story in mm -hmm. after, I think it was the Iraq war, Af Afghan war. There was this je oh, no, military guy from the United States and uh, he was building his best career possible, but he came with post-traumatic stress after war. He couldn't collect himself and started to take uh, alcohol and lost his motivation with children and wife and work and everything in life was coming. So it was this, and then nothing would help. Psychologists wouldn't help, uh, you know, nothing, nothing. And then they found an article about Iboga and they <laughs> said, well, maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know the story, you know the outcome now. That's how it typically happens. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so um, just uh, outside of money, is there anything holding you back? Um, uh, yeah, I think I have a um, different life right now. I have my, I do yoga. Um, doesn't contradict. Doesn't contradict, uh, but I'm fully invested into this. And uh, to do Iboga work, you have to invest yourself. In it. It's not just willing to do that. You have to work. You have to, especially with the experience I had. Uh, that's like full work. I mean, you have to put systems in place and spend time. And so I remain a, a Iboga advocate but uh, it's just my life went different direction right now and uh, yes. I'm busy with yoga I'm very happy with that <laughs> so in case somebody got 10,000 euro you can find this guy and uh, he can help you out with the treatment <laughs> I still have some uh, Iboga left in my apartment <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 euro uh, yeah anyway <laughs> no in Georgia it was just it was yeah, just don't, just don't mention it uh, 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 it's, it's 10,000 uh, anyway uh, <laughs> sorry quick question that just to shift gears here a bit um, so it seems that there is a very kind of um, therapeutic approach in general um, and the uh, approach that was used in, uh, originally by the ind indigenous people of African continent, does their approach have anything to do with the ceremony that's being conducted the way you do it or others do it? I wouldn't call what I was doing ceremony. What I, when I mention ceremony, I refer only to Japanese experience and uh, stuff. It's the local way, traditional way, and it's not for drug addiction. It's just general ceremonies for initiating a spiritual practice for anything. Um, what I did is not a ceremony and I haven't really taken much of the knowledge from how they do it locally. It's just a substance. I know somehow how Westerners have applied it later on, different models, and uh, try to copy one of that. Mm. I haven't been able to, I haven't had my luck to go to Gabon. I wanted to, but <laughs> back then it was, uh, I had no time, no money, <laughs> whatever. But yeah, one day I'll go there. Mm, okay. Siboga brought me back, so <laughs> I have to thank him he eats back and uh and uh, yeah always happy to promote it uh, real medical substance but not the only one there are many ways in uh, in everybody's life to find the solutions in different ways so yeah, thanks for sharing i think it's better to wrap up because we've been talking for quite a while uh but is there anything that you'd like to highlight or just talk about mention something maybe where to find you at least or i don't know anything well, no, I, <laughs> I wasn't ready for the question. <laughs> nah, cool, Maybe you got like a Twitter or something where people can find you and uh, just oh. get in touch in case they need the Iboga e experience. You know? uh, I mean, if you, if you, I mean, if you guys Google Iboga e in Georgia, usually my name comes up. Oh, okay. that's <laughs> they, convenient. I haven't tried e in, Georgia. I haven't tried in, in not in, USA I though, Georgia. I haven't tried that in English, uh, sure. but I mean, certainly. I it, should know. <laughs> but yeah, it will it will bring my my stories up, and uh, if anybody wants to connect to me, um, I guess we can provide details somewhere sure. here, not here, but yeah, here. Um, no problem. Um, uh, but yeah, I could be at least I'm, I, I don't do debug anymore, but I could at least direct uh, people to good providers. Like consult or advice. consult where they can find very good providers, and um, or which sites to follow and. Uh, you know what we had to read the information about Iboga. It that was my approach all the time because when I would meet people who are interested, I would tell them that 
go do your research. Hmm. I can tell you a lot. I will. Yeah. But go do your research because yeah. somebody Double also check. told me a lot. Yeah. But I had to find my because I really, really read a lot and uh, mm. followed a lot. So that's really important. So you kind of cultivate your interest into mm. something, not just follow somebody's advice. Yeah. So go check out Iboga and <laughs> if needed, talk to me. <laughs> yeah, perfect, man. I would like to thank you for the conversation. It was extremely enlightening and a real pleasure. Thank you Thanks much. a lot, thank David. Thank you much. Appreciate it, Cheers. Man.